I tried to repeatedly watch last week's account. Well, good morning. There we go. All right. Uh, good morning, everyone. And I just wanted to uh, welcome everyone uh, to our service this morning at the Unitarian Universalist Congregation in Eau Claire virtually. And uh, my name is Amanda Lounsdorf, and I'll be your worship associate today. So you'll see my face a lot. <laughs> and um, just to open up today's uh, topic uh, of the battle for human evolution in real time, genes versus memes. Uh, I'll read a little excerpt uh, from uh, Richard uh, Dawkins, the, Self, the Selfish Gene from 1976. They think that a new kind of replicator has recently emerged on this very planet. It is staring us in the face. It is still in its infancy, still drifting clumsily about in its primeval soup, but already it is achieving evolutionary change at a rate that leaves the old gene painting, uh, panting for far behind. The new soup is the soup of human culture. We need a name for the new replicator, a noun that conveys the idea of a cultural transmission and a unit of imitation. Um, may mean, uh, the Greek, I'm probably saying that terribly because my Greek is bad, uh, but it's Greek for that which is imitated comes from a suitable Greek root, but I want a monosyllable that sounds a bit more like gene. So I hope my classist uh, friends will forgive me if I abbreviate uh, may mean to meme. Good morning. I am Dawn Brisky. I am one of your Zoom volunteers this morning, and I'm here to talk to you about where home is where the heart is. 
So my wife, Laura, and I moved here to, um, actually we live in Tilden, to the Eau Claire area three and a half years ago. She is from Eau Claire, I'm from Chicago. She wanted to move closer to family. And um, we also wanted to be on a, on a body of water so she could go kayaking. And so we found the perfect property. But before we moved up here, I said, if we move to Eau Claire, I have just one thing that I wanna do, and that is to go to the Unitarian Church to join that congregation. Um, neither of us had been members of a Unitarian congregation, but we had friends who were ministers and we knew that we would find a welcoming home here. And indeed, um, that was the best decision that we made when we moved. Um, instead of being surrounded by Laura's family, which is wonderful, um, I immediately found myself surrounded by a group of like-minded people and people with um, intellectual curiosity that um, mirrored my own and shared interests. And so over the last three and a half years, I've become increasingly involved with this congregation. And I truly do feel like many members here are family to me. Um, I started out pretty early on, Tim Hirsch reached out to me when he knew that I worked with um, member organizations and IT. And he said, you know, we've been trying to figure out online giving for our members because younger people don't have checkbooks and they wanna to donate to us. And how do we do that? And so I helped out with that project. And from there, it's been one project after another that I've been invited to get involved in. And um, it's been wonderful. I am now the Harvest Auction Chair. And that's been a great way to get to know people who are both on the committee and then all the people who help out with that event. Um, but the other thing I love about this congregation is that if you have an interest in something, you can form a group. So um, a couple of years ago, we started a jigsaw puzzles group, jigsaw puzzler group. And that was a great way to get to know people. We brought some new people into the congregation through that. And now that we're um, virtual, we have a Facebook group for jigsaw puzzlers in this group, in this congregation. If you're not in that group, you know, let one of us know and we'll be happy to get you in there. Um, so there's so many shared interests. And of course, when you have friends, you then start find commonalities. And it just takes one person here to come up with an idea and invite a few other people. And, and then community is formed. And so the other thing that I have found really wonderful is that this seems like a very open group of people. So our congregation, people are open to, to new things, new ideas, to sharing time together. And for somebody who's not from the area, that's been really wonderful too. So indeed, this congregation is where my heart is, and I'm glad to be part of it. And that's why I'm here helping out this morning and why I continue to support it. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Megan Fuchile, and it's a new month. And I'm about to tell you about the new organization that's going to be our 50-50 Share the Plate organization. And the organization is Uniting Bridges. Your contribution today will be shared with United Bridges, an organization in the Chippewa Valley that pr promotes racial reconciliation and builds relationships across race, class, gender, ethnicity, and sexuality. They do this by sponsoring forums and educational events to promote inclusion, excellence, and diversity in the Chippewa Valley. Most recently, Uniting Bridges hosted virtual Martin Luther King and Juneteenth, Juneteenth forums, as well as a virtual memorial for George Floyd in late May. They've provided support as an incubator for the Hmong Women's Summit, and also stepped up to support keeping Converge Radio on the air. Uniting Bridges has touched so many parts of the Chippewa Valley community, co-sponsoring the Conversations in Color series at the Pablo Center, allowing for difficult topics to be discussed in a civil format as a model for how citizens of all races can work together. Uniting Bridges is also working closely with the new police chief in Eau Claire to ensure that protests can be held peacefully and effectively. Your support helps Uniting Bridges build a stronger Chippewa Valley by centering marginalized citizens and creating peace and unity among all people. Thanks, Megan. Uh, mm -hmm. Really glad to hear about the new uh, place that we'll be supporting this month. So uh, again, my name is Amanda Lonsdorf, and I'm also the uh, past president of the UUC uh, board. So I definitely wanted to take an extra moment to welcome everyone today to the Unitarian Universalist congregation virtually. And uh, we are a religious community who commit ourselves to diversity. And we hope to nourish human difference, those of gender, race, age, ability, sexual orientation, 
political views, culture, class, and religious belief. So we welcome all those who treasure freedom of conscience in the search for truth. And we promise to do our best to provide you a spiritual home. And we extend a special welcome to any of our visitors today. So hello out there. And uh, we hope that you'll follow our Facebook page uh, at this time and to participate in Zoom and receive announcements of uh, any special events or religious exploration classes. Uh, please sign up for our weekly uh, email. Uh, just send it once a week. <laughs> and uh, there should be a link in uh, the comment section on the Facebook page uh, where you can sign up. Uh, we also uh, have families uh, follow our UUC Religious Exploration Facebook page, and there are religious exploration classes from um, 4K to ninth grade and a youth group every Wednesday online from Moodle School and High School. So we're just glad that you decided to join us today. So I would like to um, light our chalice this morning, and I'm not good at multitasking, so I'm going to light it off, <laughs> off screen because I have to read. So. Uh, uh, we, I'm inviting you to light your chalice. If you have a candle at home, you're more than welcome to do that. And um, I'll read our chalice lighting uh, that will also be put in the text uh, of the chat uh, for Zoom today. As the chalice is lit, let us come together into the sacred space we have created. Let the cares of the day fall away and know that there is a place for quiet reflection, for a pause in our lives, for breathing into our true selves and let what is said and felt here add richness to the dimensions of our lives and spiritual practices. We are stronger together in community. We share the experience of being human and let the warmth of the chalice light during our time together, connect us and carry us into the world. Thank you. I forgot that I have the next part too. <laughs> uh, so uh, now's the time for our joys and concerns. And um, this is a time that we uh, share our joys and concerns in the chat if you're in uh, Zoom. And I will uh, tend to read them aloud uh, when anyone shares them with us. Um, so just feel free to put anything in the chat that you'd like me to read aloud and share at this time. And I also just hold space for folks to think about joys or concerns in their lives that, um, that you would like to contemplate and um, take a moment to honor their place in your lives for better, for worse. And Deb says, my cousin's 21 year old daughter, Natalie was killed in a car accident. I'm so sorry for your family's loss. And uh, Soma is sharing concern for anyone who is not warm right now. And there are many people that may not be. Winter can be a very difficult time for a lot of reasons. And Angela shares, and also any animals who are lost outside. Linda shares, so happy for families that all hospital patients can have a visitor with them during their hospital stay. That is uh, definitely a good thing for comfort when people are in the hospital. Susan shares a concern that today's game, I think it's a football game, does not become a super spreader of COVID. Dr. Fauci has been working so hard to communicate to everyone and keep us safe. Thank you for sharing that.
I thank everyone for sharing what joys and concerns that they were comfortable sharing at this time and um, also hold space for those joys and concerns that um, may be too tender to um, leave the folds of our hearts at this time. Uh, feel free to join me in um, reciting uh, the words to close joys and concerns. Love is the spirit of this church and service its law. This is our great covenant to dwell together in peace, to seek the truth in love and to help one another. like I was just here, <laughs> uh, especially with the singing. So I have a uh, reading for you before I introduce our uh, wonderful speaker today, who I'm excited to hear uh, from as well. So I have an excerpt from The Blind Watchmaker by Richard Dawkins in 1986. It's raining DNA outside. On the bank of the Oxford Canal at the bottom of my garden is a large willow tree and it is pumping downy seeds into the air, not just any DNA, but DNA whose code characteristics spell out specific instructions for building willow trees that will shed new generations of downy seeds. These fluffy specks are literally spreading instructions for making themselves. They are there because their ancestors succeeded in doing the same. It is raining instructions out there it's raining programs, it's raining tree growing, fluff spreading algorithms. algorithms. I can say that word. Uh, there, this is not a metaphor, it is a plain truth. It couldn't be any plainer if they were raining floppy disks. I'm very excited today to uh, be able to introduce uh, some of you who may not know Will. Uh, Will Taylor is a longtime congregation member and former chair of biology department at UW Eau Claire. And he has started teaching evolution, or he started teaching their evolution there soon after his arrival, and it remains one of his favorite subjects to discuss. So I'm excited for everyone to uh, get to meet Will or hear from him again if they have heard from him in the past. So thank you for uh, joining us today. Am I on? I think I'm on. Good morning, everyone. Um, welcome to Darwin Day 2021. Uh, the organizing theme of our reflections today is information. And as determined as I was when I agreed to talk this year to avoid talking about the pandemic, uh, it became apparent in a month or so ago that it was going to be utterly unavoidable. Um, I hope you agree by the end uh, that uh, my nod to the topic that keeps on giving uh, and taking um, is uh, worth a few pithy insights that, I'm, that I'll now share with you. Uh, information has always been important to humans, uh, from what foods are safe to eat, to how to build a fire, to the development of tools. Um, all of them are based on information. Um, furthermore, it could be argued that the beginning of the Dark Ages in Europe was the result of the loss of a dominant cultural influence, that being the Roman Empire, 
who could protect and disseminate learned information, and that the emergence from the Dark Ages was fueled by a slow spread of centers of learning and libraries that rediscovered and preserved the ancient sources of information and paved the way to build upon that information. And uh, no quick summary of the history of information would be complete without a nod to the development of the printing press. Uh, for millennia, books were incredibly rare and copied by hand by scribes, and the printing press made them more widely available, and with that, the dissemination of information. On the so-called age of discovery, with all of its well-deserved faults, conquest, colonialism, breathtaking European chauvinism, ushered in an unprecedented frenzy of the collecting of biological specimens from far and wide. Now, some of this widespread collecting was financed uh, by the upper class fashion of populating what came to be known as a cabinet of curiosities. Uh, this fashion involved a room and a cabinet was once a term for a small private room, which is how we get the US cabinet as an advisory group to the president. Uh, that contained a display of items of either cultural or biological interest. <clears throat> the more strange and exotic, the better. They even sought out items in the realm of the fantastic. And here I use the word in its original sense, that is to say from the Latin fantasticus, meaning imaginary. <clears throat> One intellectual from this period earned some infamy for recognizing that the tusk from a narwhal was from a, ray, a whale, a real actual aquatic animal and not from a unicorn. One can only imagine how that might have created some sense of disappointment among the holders of that once perceived mythical item. If you'll indulge me just a moment of reverie, that there was a period of time when people would gather and view natural objects solely as a means of generating pleasant conversations over an aperitif just gives me a warm glow. You have to recall that I spent 30 years working to get teenagers interested in plants. So I think you'll understand some of the source of my romanticized vision of the past. But all this biological gathering was not just for the entertainment of visitors. There was in fact a religious underpinning to it as well. Christianity in Europe dominated intellectual discourse at this time. But unlike today, religion and science were not in conflict. As late as the 19th century, it was unquestioned that religious conclusions and scientific conclusions had to be harmonious. The very hall where Darwin and Wallace's seminal paper on natural selection was read in 1858, the Linnaean Society of London, was half scientists and half theologians. The theologians were continuing the long tradition of interpreting scriptures, that is the word of God. The scientists were studying the physical work of the creator. The link between these was something called natural theology. Natural theology was a discipline that was dedicated to interpreting God's creation by studying nature as a proxy for the mind of God. So the book of nature was seen as parallel and supportive to the actual words of God in the Bible. So those two sides of the Linnaean society were actually working together to achieve the same goals. Now, Darwin's ideas in evolution were a significant blow to this intellectual harmony. Darwin hit upon his mechanism of evolution, natural selection in about 1838, but he wouldn't go public with it until he was forced to do so 20 years later. And it's clear from his private writings that he didn't fear censure because of his scientific ideas, such as the idea that all living things are created by common descent, but because his mechanism didn't require the intervention of a defined being. He knew it was a short step from denying intervention to denying existence. And in the mid, in the mid 1800s, that was heresy. Now, one of the results of this massive influx of new kinds of information from around the globe about biological things was how to organize it on the way to reading the book. The language of the learned class was Latin, so several systems of naming all the new organisms arose. But the system of one man, Carl Linnaeus, won out in the end. Linnaeus used a system that employed only two names, and the Latin binomial is with us today. We are Homo, the name of our genus, Sapiens, the name of our species. Now at a higher organizational level, Linnaeus organized all the new life in a hierarchical system with nested categories. And this is the system of biological nomenclature that some of you may recall from some past biology class. At the top of the scale were kingdoms, kingdoms were divided into phyla, phyla into classes, and so on down the scale until you ended with the small categories of genus broken up into a number of species. Now, Linnaeus was a creationist, just like everyone else of his time. So when the idea of a common ancestor 
for all life became obvious and what came to eventually be employed as a metaphor for this was a tree, um, Linnaeus's system was already adaptable to this idea. It was a smooth transition from his nested system to a tree analogy. But in the mid 18, 1800s, it was still a complete mystery what the storehouse of all that information for making an organism was. Uh, to cling to the idea that the creator took care of those details, every single one was increasingly unsatisfying, especially from a scientific perspective. Um, it was being discovered because of microscopy um, that all organisms start as a single cell, which then divides many, many times to give rise to that whole organism. But the process was cryptic to say the least. At that point in time, uh, one of the popular hypotheses was that each sperm cell had a little tiny preformed human inside of it. It was called preformation. It didn't take long for someone to conclude that that little preformed man had sperm inside of him, each of which had even tinier preformed humans and so on. And as silly as that may sound to us now, this idea at the time was more plausible than that any set of instructions could exist inside that single cell. Well, eventually we got the answer which is that each of those so-called zygotes, which is the single cell from which we all come, union of sperm and egg, does indeed contain a set of instructions, not blueprints, which is sometimes incorrectly stated, but instructions. And it's in the form of a chemical called deoxyribonucleic acid, or DNA. And here we arrive at the modern interpretation of evolutionary information as described in uh, both of the Dawkins readings for today. Uh, the one immediately prior to this, where he was talking about the willow seeds, please forgive the quaint references, at least now quaint references, to floppy disks as a storage medium. Um, that was a state of the art in 1986. But those floppy willow fruits that he described, each did contain the instructions for another willow tree. And this has been repeated for hundreds of millions of years. Now, at this point, I need to discriminate between different kinds of information which have relevance to human evolution. When we're talking about the information on DNA, that information is clustered together on the DNA in the functional units called genes. Um, Dawkins, as was described in the first reading, first came to prominence with his book, book, The Selfish Gene, in which he argued that the relevant units of evolution are not individuals or even the species, but the genes, some of which transcend all higher categories. As an example of this, um, one gene that codes for proteins that allow us to make energy in our cells, human cells, is identical point for point to that that is in all plants. It is in fact the bacterial genes, so it's billions of years old. So these gene categories transcend time. So the selfish gene is what has survived the process of evolution according to Dawkins first book. Now, you won't be surprising to hear that the exalted humans chafed at the suggestion that something other than the, the organism was the unit of evolution. Uh, so his ideas uh, were and are somewhat provocative. And however you choose to view the most important unit of evolution, one of the key takeaways is that the process of organic change, another word for evolution, that resulted in the bewildering diversity of life that we see on Earth today is gradual and extremely slow. It's only the immensity of time at a level that's allowed this diversity to form. Now, if we consider this in terms of human evolution, uh, we can look to a rough origin of our species in Africa at about 300,000 years ago. So using an average generational span of about 30 years, that means 10,000 generations to get from a tribe of hunter gatherers that look pretty much like we do today, though with primitive tools, to what we see today. Now, this is an astoundingly rapid rate of evolution by any standards. If we continue the appearance of artifacts that mark the development of traits, we think of as uniquely human, <clears throat> things like art, increasingly sophisticated tools, then that compresses the time frame to maybe 65,000 years. So clearly something else is at play. And that was described well in the first reading today. And that something is culture. Now Dawkins, uh, in coining the term meme, I'm sure seriously doubted the ever expected this term to become as prevalent as it is. Uh, of course, he mused on cultural evolution and how it related to biological evolution. Um, and as a parallel term to gene, he introduced the term meme. And it's become ubiquitous in the internet age. Since 2007, there's even been a website dedicated to uh, knowyourmeme.com. Now, You've all heard the term, you probably have a reasonable grasp on its meaning, especially as it refers to things that propagate on the internet. 
there's just a little hazy on it. I'll offer a little primer as it compares to the biological counterpart. Genes generated by reproduction, passing of coded information, extremely slow. But, and with the rapid advances with, in terms of the meme, what started as word of mouth from the tribe member right next to you moved to the development of symbolic shapes, writing that could be transported long distances, to electronics dots and dashes, to recorded actual speech, to today's zeros and ones in our wired world. And the current incarnation of this transfer of information, of course, is the epic high pressure fire hose of the internet. So the rate of transfer of cultural information is many orders of magnitude faster than that of biological evolution. So if for the sake of argument, we ignore the interplay between these two, culture and genes, and simplistically say that the evolution of our species is dependent on these two factors and treat it like a horse race. Which one will win? What will determine the fate of our species? How does slow plodding biological evolution even stand a chance against this nimble juggernaut that is cultural evolution? The answer seems obvious, but what if there was something else to level the playing field? Certainly human reproduction is far too slow to make a difference. But what about something else? It's been estimated that the average viral load of an infected COVID patient is about 10 to the 10th viral particles. That's 10 billion particles. Every one of those particles was produced by genetically expressing the virus's genome in an infected cell. Each one was a separate copy event. The worldwide COVID infection as of yesterday was estimated to be 105 million. That's 1.5 times 10 to the eighth. So that's a total number of replication events in the range of 10 to the 18th so far. That's a lot of zeros. I think anyone would concede that in its brief existence in the human realm, COVID, a biological entity, has tipped the scales towards the biological side of the race, at least as, as it concerns human behavior. Now, among those 10 to the 18th copying events are billions of mutations. And while the vast majority of those mutations, as with all biological mutations, are a detriment to further replication of the organism, we're all intimately aware of how a few of those that are not play an outsized role. We now have COVID variants that are more infectious and possibly more lethal. Also, in biological systems, many of those copying errors that occur actually get corrected by built-in genetic proofreading systems. Now, speaking of mutations, memes mutate too. Anyone, anyone ever heard of Pepe the Frog? This anthropomorphized frog first appeared in a 2005 comic called Boys Club by a writer named Matt Fury, but it was subsequently adopted, mutated if you will, by the alt-right in the run-up to the 2016 election, much to the consternation of the author. It even came to appear on a list of hate symbols in 2016. And as we likely all realize, and this stands in contrast to the gene, unlike the genetic proofreading system, there's little in the way of corrective system on the internet. And a few of those mimetic mutations are even linked to our little imagined race between genes and memes. Take the meme of anti-masking. This meme has actually enhanced the spread of the virus. And lest we forget, anti-vaxxing. So those who adhere to this philosophy will actually slow the pace to eat herd immunity. So maybe it isn't, the race isn't over for biological evolution anyway. So ever since I gave this Darwin Day presentation a decade or so ago, um, and during a congregational dialogue, somebody asked a question about the history of humanity, and I just tossed off that I thought it would probably involve being succumbing to infectious disease. And I realized later in private conversations that in, in making that statement, it apparently traumatized a few people in the audience. I try to end these things on a hopeful note. Um, this is all the more important given the topic of today's talk. I think the most obvious way to end is that despite these unproductive memes that I just described that are aiding the virus, traits that have allowed us to dominate the planet, consciousness, planning, tool manufacture and use, have also allowed us to mount a technological defense in the form of a vaccine. And for that, I think we could be thankful. So thanks for listening everybody and stay safe and warm. All right. 
Well, thank you uh, for the, the talk. I really appreciate it. I always enjoy hearing what you have to say. So <laughs> part of the reason I enjoy doing these services with you. So I appreciate uh, your words today. And uh, we would like to um, move to the giving uh, portion of our um, service today. So uh, with the gratitude for the abundance in our lives, we give to help people in need and support the work of this congregation. So uh, as you heard earlier, our 5050 Share the Plate recipient for February is Uniting Bridges, and you can donate online uh, at uueauclair.com or text to give at 84321. Uh, that information will also be, as it just got popped up, into the chat as well. Thank you, and uh, please enjoy our music for giving. Sorry about that. I am having some technical difficulties. There we go. See if this works now. No. There we go. Thank you for listening and being here today. And um, I, now's the time to extinguish our, our cal uh, chalice, candle, whichever you want to use. If you have yours at home, feel free to bring that with you and we can uh, say the words together to extinguish our chalice for today. We extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we are together again. And now we have our closing words for today. This is a reading uh, titled, As We Part, Now We Are from, uh, One From Another by Eileen uh, Carpels. As we part now, one from another, let this be our thoughts. If that which is most holy lies within the human person, and if the greatest power in the world shines flickering and uncertain from each individual heart, then it is easy to see the value of human association dedicated to nurturing that light. The couple, the family, the religious community. For the power of good in any of us must at times waver. But when a group together is dedicated to nurturing the power of good, it is rare for the light to grow dim in all individuals at the same moment. So we borrow courage and wisdom from one another to warm us and keep us until we are together again. 
So for those of you watching our Facebook live stream, I'm again glad that you decided to join us today. And if you'd like to get information on how to join services in Zoom, you can fill out the visitor link in the Facebook comments. So um, well, those attending Zoom, uh, we'll take a brief moment to share any joys or concerns um, or share names that you might not have uh, felt uh, able to share during the service or maybe came to you later. And then we'll move to our breakout rooms for chatting and discussion and um, just togetherness.